I want to say a big thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. And just so you know how useful they are, they just brought me a message to say that somebody is driving a Toyota RAV4. <laughs> AAA 443DZ Blue. Go and remove your car, it's on fire. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hopefully, we see you again. Thanks. So that's, those are our volunteers, 2018. Did we get a photo? No. Where are the photographers? Did you? Good. So now I would like to invite my team, Chiebuka, Obumselu, Alex, Madugu, um, Grace Gigi, Afolabi Adela, just make your way here. Don't do that thing you people always do to me. I'll be saying, I'll call my team and one person shows up. That's what they do. Thank you. This one, she likes the limelight. <laughs> Where is Alex? See her waving like the queen. <laughs> Alex. Okwe. Where are they? They're coming good. Afolabi, Soji. Did you get them from the bookstore? Yes. Okay. Where is um, Amaka? Okay. Good. And Yola. They're so cute. Oh, Tireni. I know what you're all thinking. It's like I only employ women. Right? It's not true. We have three boys. Three. We tolerate them and we understand their limitations. <laughs> Hold on. You know, we, we didn't think it would look good if, if we, we were, it was an all woman team, so we, we wanted to help some of them, so we let them work with us. <laughs> Afolabi, where are you? Afolabi, Ademola, and Soji. Plus, we always need people to help us carry those big boxes of books. So th that's the other reason why we've um, retained them. <laughs> eh? You've been good in that department. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> eh? Not a great, but... You try, you try. <laughs> Demola, where are you? You see. Where's Soji? Is he on his way? Oh, they haven't closed. They're counting money. Cash money. So where's my Amaka? Oh, but what about Afolabi? Is Afolabi here? He's in the office? Okay. All right. So, obviously, we've got a lot of people going back home tonight. And um, Anna Falabi is in charge of logistics, so he's not often... He doesn't like coming out to stuff like this. He's, he thinks he's better than all of us, but it's okay. <laughs> we, we know the truth. <laughs> so, this is, this is my team. This is most of them. There's Tireni, who interned with us and came back from England from school just to come and spend this time with us. Mayowa, where are you? Is Mayowa here? No, he's probably in the green room drinking alcohol. That's my son. You may have seen him with the hair. That's the kind of children they have these days. You ask them to come to an important occasion, they prepare to go and drink beer. So anyway, no problem. I forgive him. It's just like his father. Um, so these, this, is, this is my team. And they are wonderful. Never in my life have I enjoyed working with young people so much. Um, they inspire me. They make me want to be a better person. I feel so vulnerable sometimes, and this is weird when I'm with them because I know I need to be careful about everything that I do 
So I've become so conscious um, about setting a good example. And I want to thank you all for that. And I know that I fail miserable, miserably in this setting a good example thing. Just forgive me. And I just want to say that I'm going to fail more. It's my nature and it's just my behavior. Accept me as I am. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So, um, I, 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 I can't and I won't ask all the incredible um, guests, speakers that we've had. I'm not going to ask them to all come out again like we did just to impress the VP. So, I'm just going to ask them to stand up where they are, just very briefly. My mic has... Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Wait, so, uh, hey, wait, 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 wait. Just stand up again, please. Stand. Sorry, my mic was gone for a minute, and you know how much I love the sound of my own voice. So, <laughs> there they are. There are more of them possibly hiding, and it's fine. Please, this round of applause you gave was a Lagos one. We need to now give them an Aki one, because without them, we wouldn't be here. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf, on behalf of my family and my generation, <laughs> on behalf of Lagos State, on behalf of every Nigerian, I say a big thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's talk about money a bit here. Um, I know there's somebody here from Sterling Bank, and he would be absolutely mortified if I called him out here today. But the truth is, it's possible that I, I would never ever even be able to visit this hotel, this fancy place again, if not for the funding that we got from Sterling Bank. When I say, Um, when I say that we wouldn't be here if not for this bank, it probably sounds like hyperbole, but it's actually not. Um, they've been incredibly supportive, not just by giving us money, which is essential for paying for all the things that we need to pay for, but just in terms of support, being there when we need to talk to them, for instance, we didn't have much money for transports, so I kind of twisted someone's arm to see if they could get us some of their staff buses. And lo and behold, the two buses were parked in front, in front of the hotel on Saturday and on Sunday. That's what you want from a partner, somebody who comes, who is there when you need them. And that is what Sterling Bank have done for us. I have never felt more confident in organizing a festival. I have never felt, um, you know, you know when you feel in at the back of your mind that even if things go wrong, you'll be okay. That's the feeling that Sterling Bank has given me. And I really, really appreciate that. Thank you, Sterling Bank. Thank you also, Annoying Logo. Why is this man like this? Security. So, we don't know who they are. We may never know who they are. Um, 
but I want to thank them because a lot of these books that are available here, the reason we can buy those books from the US, from the UK, is because of the foreign exchange that we get from them. I'm really very open about how we get money and everything because one needs to be. Because when you look at it and you look at this and you're thinking, wow, this Lola must be very rich. But actually, it's not the case at all. It's just that we have great people supporting us that we can lean on. The Book Buzz Foundation, which organizes Ake Festival, is a non-governmental organization. So we, we're not allowed to you know, participate in commercial activity or anything. All the money goes back into the pot and we have to pay our taxes. Even though we're an NGO, Nigerian government still taxes us. We still have to do that, like all of you. But it's okay. It's a war we will win one day. So I want to thank all our sponsors as well. Many of you have had... Gala is not allowed at Ake Festival again, ever. We will only be having beef roll from Right Foods. Many of you have also visited the bookstore and had the biggie drinks. Did you have one? Let me see. Show of hands, quickly, let me see. Okay, good. Tropical Coke, Fanta, Lemon Lime, all those delicious drinks that um, we had there. That was Curtsy um, Right Foods. Can you please give them a round of applause for me? I also want to thank Unilever, Lipton, for their support and how they've stood behind us this year. Um, not just money. The money they gave us was not very much, but they gave us a lot of support. And that's wonderful. If you see the tent they created, the whole kitchen butterfly thing, we sold them an idea and they agreed and they just said yes. And of course, the v vice president of um, Unilever was here at the welcome ceremony. So I really appreciate them, along with Goethe Institute, British Council, the French Cultural Center, the US Embassy, who have all been very, very generous in supporting us with funding, with spaces, all kinds of support. Every single one at the back of that publication, Ake Review, um, the festival guide that you have in your hands, I want to say a massive thank you to everybody. Please, can you help me thank them? Please, <laughs> the round of applause. <laughs> and all the supporters as well. So lastly, um, before we go into the poetry, I really want to thank all of you who came, who registered. Some people registered from abroad, came to this. We've got Wim back, back there. Wim has been harassing us for about three months. Stand up, Wim. Yeah. Where have you come from again? Sorry? He's come from Amsterdam. I don't know him from Adam. I don't even know why he's here at Sake Festival. But we are glad he came. You know? We have a lot of foreign journalists like that who just turn up and want to hang out with us. And I think it's brilliant. And I hope we've um, made a good impression. Thank you so much. We are always like that in Lagos. <laughs> Nigeria is very, very nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so huge thank you to all of you, the guests, all of you wearing these orange um, lanyards. Without you, the truth is, we'd just be talking to each other, which wouldn't be very nice, especially with people like Neddy and Deb. They like to talk a lot. Neddy and Deb. Uh, uh, Tochi. <laughs> eh? <laughs> I'm joking. They are wonderful, and we learn so much from them. But yes, you guys are everything. Oh. The way you tweet about the events, the way you talk about the events, I love you and I appreciate all of you. And I'm saying that on behalf of my own team. Thank you so much for coming and sharing these three days with us. So <laughs> this person that I want to thank now, and that's Ola. The only reason I'm thanking him, I'm just telling you, is because every time I don't thank him, he, 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 it's like he wants to strangle me when <laughs> afterwards. So I want you to thank him, actually because this has been a very difficult festival for a lot of 
the, a lot of stuff has been happening behind the scenes. Got nothing to do with the festival. Just some, you know, personal things that have happened to some of our friends. We've actually lost two people over the course of, uh, course of this festival. And it's been quite a difficult time. But it's been nice to be able to lean on him and, you know, kind of call him in the early hours to just say, look, what the hell is going on? You're all wondering why I'm calling him. Yeah? Okay. I think I'm just going to tell them. We have a very, very <laughs> sort of modern um, relationship and modern way of living. We live in the same estate, but we live in different flats. So I have my own because, I, no, I'm serious. <laughs> so sometimes I have to phone him to say, dude, do you have Gary? You know, and things like that. But it's, it's just, um, and, and just for being there to support me, but also being there all the time. Every time someone disappoints or says, oh, I can't make it anymore. The good thing is that no matter the panel, I can just say, Ola, you have to take this panel because there's nobody else. And he always says, okay. So please just help me thank him. For that. Um, and of course, all our dignitaries, and my, my dearest sister, the first lady of Kaduna State, you wouldn't even know that she was a, there was a first lady in our midst. Isn't that incredible? You know? But she's here. She's a writer. And she comes in quietly, enjoys herself like a normal human being. That's the one thing I like about her, you know? And it's great. It's always wonderful to have you. You honor us with your presence. Thank you very much. And we send our, our love and um, our best to the people of Kaduna State. We know that they're having a difficult time at the moment. And we hope the peace returns to Kaduna State. Yeah. I also want to thank the technical people. All of them. Where's Show? Show and Olapo. Where's Show? Where is he? Is he out here? He's there. Come here. Come. Get away, my friend. Come here. Let me cut. You heard uh, Jeff Ryman saying I'm terrifying at the welcome ceremony. We're not asking you to come here. Saying no, my friend, come here. Uh, stay there. This is Shil. He's been with us for the last, I think, four or five AK festivals now. We go everywhere together from Kaduna. Any job you have that needs live streaming, any media reporter, anything, this is your person. Enhance 360. Thank you so much for everything. I think I've done everybody now. Have I forgotten anyone? Oh. That's one I, I um, I'm, me, I'm just grateful for this. So we're going to go straight into the poetry. I think I've talked enough now. Where's my... Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have a guide? Festival guide? Can I borrow one? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ah, the kind of sleep I'm going to sleep tonight. <laughs> I'm so happy. How come it? Ah, okay. So this is going to be quite random. Um, I'm just going to invite these poets one by one who will all share six minutes of their work with us. Um, let me see. Should we start in Nigeria or abroad? The abroad? The abroad. Okay. In that case, I'm going to invite someone whose name just really fascinates me. All the way from Angola and Portugal. Join me in, in welcoming Nastio Mosquito. <laughs>
If I had permission to kill tall people with incapacity to pay the right bills, if I had permission to kill, kill, kill tall people with incapacity to pay their right bills, bills, bills. And this is Monday. For in Wednesday, I'm, I'm, I'm in a different place. You speak of power like you know what it is. Yeah, speak to power like you know what it is. Yeah, speak about power like you witnessed what it is. Oh, brother, please. Sister, please. Just down free. For by Friday yet again. Who said that? Who said that? Who said that? You look at the stars. And it's all good. You're silent in the crowd. Look just what they didn't tell you now. Uh, come space, a distrust. You want to let it go now. Allow yourself to entertain. You're scared of what you're doing now. You want to let it rest and allow yourself to entertain. And then there comes hope. And there comes hope. And it comes hope. Dressed like a punk rock pope. The problem is that Eye mi pe fun mi tele tele eko akete ilu agbo to ba duro ku sora ko ni yogi eko crab with stuttering footsteps lagos rigus past entropy in motion this city is audacious. Without remorse, it will leave you spent, hawk-opated Pentecostal rhythms. This video won't part Red Seas or the Lagoon. Scared of blood and sweat and tears, tread bare and tax-free. And Evan should do it today, on time. When I wasn't writing, I ticked away hours, bantering, preening, touch screening. Cyber missives wheeled away by unread terms of conditions that apply. I strive to be normal again, human, as I free fall from the hyperhuman pedestal where writers preside. I look in the mirror and see beyond a punch and a receding airline that seemed to say, Time to go. A year switches faster than a yawn. Ask maidens how quickly one can become more than one. Ask mothers how fast daughters can be gone. Ask fathers the time it takes for dreams to become undone. Time, like time disappears into a broth. 
This secret for centuries has brought men to strange tables and beds, heads bowed, fingers cupped in the routine of digging into sitting soups of concubines in lieu of time spent with cruelest better halves, in lieu of time spent drinking fine wine with friends. Time trickles and tickles, cycling with the ease of men in the evening of their lives. Time connives with land to rid us of promises and pleasures. Time deceives stopwatches and defeats war clocks. Even the errant cock plays prey. When I wasn't writing, time was cheating on me. Thank you. Do I have enough time to read the final poem? One Mama, I it down. One minute. Okay. You have one minute. Tonight, I remember your iPod sitting in, t sitting in its dock at the edge of the reading table you bought me, a relic of our time as old souls trapped in young bodies. You play me your favorite song because love is assimilation. I ask what Chan Chan means. You say you do not know, but it must be about patriotism of love for country, hands shaking the Cuban flag, heads swollen with national pride. <laughs> but this is not what Wikipedia says. It's a love song about Chan Chan and Wanika, man and his woman building a house on a beach. Chan Chan collects sand and puts it on the heap. Wanika shakes the heap and shakes herself. And when she shakes herself, Chan Chan is aroused. But this too is patriotism, the loyal swelling of a man's body, because a woman's body is For those who did not understand Oloduni, sh should I translate it for you? Okay. All right. He was saying that everybody here is exceptionally smart. All right. So I think it's time to have a female poet. So I'm going to invite my sister. Miss Wana Wana! Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Do you remember our first kiss? Succulent. Sticky and sweet like ripened mangoes. Our elbows grazed each other. Our fingers locking promises between open spaces. My stomach was twirling. With tiny monsters spreading their wings inside, our love was terrifying. I prayed for this. Us. I remember you holding my chest in your palms. You squeezed so tight, afraid I would slip. I was too weightless to feel my feet. That night, when we sipped on our friendship, staining the inside of our cheeks, letting the flavor settle on our tongues, my mouth was overflowing till I spilled our love on the tablecloth. I wanted to bottle it up like little girls do fireflies in mason jars, knowing you would always, always scare away the dark. You spread your lips in a smile, the shape of an anchor. I knew I was home. Now I'm praying that 20 years from now, even when we have woken up to our backs facing each other, negotiated peace treaties in our bed will write our love story across wrinkled faces i will run my fingers through the grove of your brow like picture perfect memories and when we have a daughter 
She'll purse her lips like yours in her sleep, furrow her nose like mine when thoughts are locked in deep. She will not inherit my wars, not atone for your sins. I am clasping my palms, praying again that 20 years from now that our love will ripen like our first kiss, succulent, sticky, and sweet. And so you must never discard the bones. Boil them till the marrow slips and melts on your tongue. Nothing about you is useless. Soften your heart. You need to be tender enough to soak up the flavors. Temper enough to mop up the juice. You mustn't be hard to swallow. Revel in your beauty. There is something about texture and tone that make for a gastronomic feast. You are stunning. Adorn your flesh like silk. Let it drape you, cascade over your shoulders, mold itself between your breasts, sliding down your thighs, hugging your calves, gently covering your feet, dripping on your toes. Hold your head up high and waltz like you are the bell at the ball. You are a feast for every eye. Take your time. You need to marinate, mold, and mature. You see, a stew from your mother's clay pot was never made in a day. You needn't be rushed. Renew your spirit. Prayers are the tender embers that simmer to perfection. Blow lightly, you need not scream. It hears your heart speak. Now take the first bite. Please yourself, love yourself, feed yourself. Forgive, regrets will ruin the broth. Let go, bitterness shares no room with exquisite flavors, but keep the leftovers. They make for worthwhile memories. Besides, there is always a lesson to learn. When the pain gets too heavy, open your mouth and spit it out. You must never chew. You must never swallow. Because nobody will come for you when you are writhing in pain from a stomach swollen with anguish. Nobody will come for you when you silently scream in a stillbirth. When the pain gets too heavy, make sure you open your mouth and spit it out. So I wasn't going to do this poem, but everybody kept bothering me to do it. <laughs> kept harassing me that I have to do this poem because I feel like I, I wanted to retire this poem, but I've been, Lola, am I allowed? <laughs> She clutched me in her clay-colored arms, frail and thin, bruised from the warring earth. She suckled me from her fallen breasts, beaten of life she laid me on her chest. Her heart thumping like a steady drum beat, she said, you will not be catfish, point and kill. They will not choose you like they chose me. You came with an entrance, umbilical cord wound so tight around your neck like hands pressing against your throat. I feared you would break. The silence was deafening, the longest I had ever heard. The air was stiff and my world stood still, but you came. This thing, starry-eyed, head adorned in a kinky bouquet, from dancing a combi in my womb and somersaulting to praise songs, shrugging those shoulders, believing you had arrived. You would never listen, but hear me when I say you will not be catfish. Point and kill, wriggling like a worm devoured as prey licked to the bone. You must tell your daughters this tale, that they will not be catfish. Point and kill, they will not choose them like they chose me. Thank you. Hmm. 
I want to just type out that second poem and put it on my door <laughs> to be loving myself every day. Hmm. Hmm? You do love yourself like that. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm just trying to see which country to go to next. Mm, UK. Let's go to Uganda. Join me in welcoming all the way from the UK, Nick Makoha. Everyone got jokes. Okay, all right. All right, so uh, laugh now. Laugh as much as you can. Go. Because none of my poems are happy, so you better get it out now. Okay. Don't worry about it, but it's, it's, good, it's good poetry. So I'm going to give you uh, three or four poems. The first is called King of Myths. Some of you might have some postcards. It's about the Idi Amin regime. Uh, it's from this book, Kingdom of Gravity, um, King of Myth. Back when you were taken from our lives, like the Son of God ascending to heaven, to another life, policemen on their motorbikes named you King of Myth. You danced to toss grenades, all part of the charade in this fire ritual. In a restless air, we surrendered our weapons, axe heads, shanks, short rope, and some poison, with all its animal understanding. Now fair game to the enemy with our world in their scope. They came down hills, phantoms from a fallen sky, with years of practice at soft landings onto rooftops in darkness, like a spirit, slipping into skin. The violence of their guns kept our voices from escaping. You know, a silence in the trees can easily be mistaken for wind. Honey, I'm still free, take a chance on me as the radio sings. So a few of my friends, writers at the back, they're about to leave in a, in a few hours to a flight. So just wish them farewell. Farewell, yeah. So one of the things I know, in my childhood, I was always on planes or waiting. So this poem is called MBA. It's the code for Mombasa. And it's a poem um, I wrote um, about, um, there are several poems in the book dealing with how I'm always in, in places of transition, MBA. Minutes after the Airbus took off, a German girl in first class starts talking about the afterlife and things that belong to the dead. One man, he drinks duty-free rum to replace the taste of sugar cane. His skin, hissing and splitting like a fuse as the sun glides in reverse. He is mastering the art of being a very persistent illusion. This is mine. The world is connected by a circle. The same circle a man might make, folding his arms around another man's shoulder. Light bends through the cabin. At the edge of my window, small towns pass. Clouds cascade and dance. We're both holding our breath. Reciting the laws of probability, my eyes are closed. I call it the garden of the blind because I am back in the old world where light bends through the clouds. The policeman at the kiosk loves the taste of his own words. Women jostle for provisions. Their children wade ankle deep in water. Their reflections dance across the surface. Two continents away, a cameraman raises his hand for silence in an ore refinery that looks a lot bigger than he imagined. They are moving in the dark. A camera looking for a quality of lost light. They are moving by memory of a stolen blueprint tattooed to their minds. I have the same tattoo. All right, so I want to do two more poems for you. The, this one's called Beatitude. It's about um, rebel leaders. Um, um, I think I was talking with Ola. We had a conversation. Uh, we're talking about basically the world is full of dictators. It's nothing new. And this poem kind of speaks to that conversation. Beatitude. 
When a rebel leader promises you the world seen in commercials, he will use a quilt of bristling static to muffle the tears. When the crowds disperse, discarded like the husk of mangoes, he will weep with you in those hours of reckoning and judgment into a hollow night when the crowds disperse, when by paraffin light, his whiskey breath tells you your mother's wailings in your father's bed are a song for our nation as he sits with you to witness a sunrise. Say nothing. Slaughter your herd. Feed the soldiers who just looted your mills and factories. Let them dance in the garden while the old man watches. Then, when your fury has turned to kerosene, find your mother gathering water at the well to stave off the burning. Shave her head with a razor from the kiosk. And when the fury has gathered, take her hand and run. Plus the odor of blood and bones, past the checkpoint, towards that smoky disc flaring in the horizon. Run till your knuckles become as white as handkerchiefs. Run into a night's fluorescent silence. Run till your knuckles, be 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 to till your knuckles in your lungs become a furnace of flames. Run past the border, past sleep, past darkness visible. Stop when you find a country where they no longer know your name. All right, so uh, if I haven't said it already, excuse my bad manners. Thank you, Lola, for everything you've done. This is this uh, festival's first class, you know, yeah? Um, yeah, man, I like it, I like it. It's good to be black, it's good to be African. Yeah. It's good to be in a black space, eating black food on a black day with my black skin. All right, so let me just get that off my chest. Hey, all right, last one. Smile again, because there's no smiles in the room. But uh, what I want you to do, this poem is called, it was the last poem I wrote for the book. All I want you to do is remember the bird. What I want you to do? She's paying attention. You, you're just sitting in your chair picking your nose. One more time. Stop laughing, mama. Stop it. Yeah. All right. Remember the bird. One, two, three. Remember the? Bird. All right. So this plane is called Bird in Flames. Eh, eh. Shall I? Okay. Bird in Flames. Let's start again. One man in his beard talks to another man after a swig of a dark bottle. His lips leak out a... Hmm. In the first death, I'm a bird, darting from an oncoming pickup truck under starlight as I head for the grass, a static quiet. The pickup drives down the road. Two men mention genocide. A third struggles to confess that he has spoken to the tribe and it stirred a conflict. Earlier, the third man was blindfolded. An arm at the bottleneck of his throat, a knife at his wrists, Others surrounded him in a circle under a low purple light. Discomfort dripped from his mouth. They were looking for a reaction. The moment was disguised as a get-together, hence the beer, meat, and chapatis, and women's voices rising up outside over music. Earlier, the third man, arms were crossed as a deep voice enters the discussion and asks him, truthfully, Bishop, where are the arms? The night had an Indian heat. Silence glued the third man to his seat. The voice had set a table and leaned in and rolled up his sieve and invited him to join him once he had told him where the guns are. The guns. The Bishop replied, I can live without your formalities, without these casualties. I mean, what meal have you prepared that I have not eaten? Back in the pickup, the bodies are not moving. No side glances. They pass a school, a settlement, a store, a trading post, up in the hills, but there is no conversation. Notice the bird. Since the moment has passed, I can tell you there was no bird. But the men were real and the chair with its table full of food. 
The only thing missing were the guns, a second death. That is how nations die over there. And when I say nation, I mean tribe. And when I say tribe, I mean people. And when I say over there, I mean here. Thank you. somebody to help me take this dress up by one inch. It's too long. Okay, so now we're going to go to a poet who's from northern Nigeria. We've heard him in Kaduna. He's come to our K Festival before. But he's actually based in the U.S. now, so we had to fly this guy down. But we are supremely proud to introduce this Lagos Ake crowd to Sadiq Zukogi. So um, um, I'm happy for you because I mean you've already enjoyed brilliant performances. So whatever I do, you're you're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, first, um, thank you for having me. I um, left my eight-day-old son Farid to be here because Ake is that special. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna read three poems. One um, about my mom, and the other about a father, and the other about someone really special. I used to pray a lot growing up. This baby afraid of what remains, the heavy dark. Dark shadows breath breathing back from every corner of the room. The dark things, the teeth slip when mother's prayers whispered and handwritten offerings I pressed to my chest. The willpower of words soaked in blood for the round body. The heart that cycles the and becomes invisible in the dark of nightmares. My mother's prayers, an offering on my tongue, a giant apple. One night forgotten, I woke up halfway, a snake bite on my leg. I watched mother wipe blood off my two pin piercing. In the morning, I woke up with no wound, no scar. Father said it all happened in my head. Mother prayed her handwritten prayers wrinkled beneath my pillow. Their crinkle said it would happen and I will tell and tell it so much until it stops making sense. And I wonder how God will understand what falls between her teeth, what lands pureed on my tongue, what is still being swallowed. Thank you. And the next poem is a poem I um, titled Unseen. The landscape retracts into the night, a room large enough to swallow all things endured. A butterfly floods the flame creased into the butt of a cigarette my father drops on the pavement. I can go on. Let my voice duplicate every salted wound on your body until my stories become your bones. Go on until my body too becomes your body while each abide its own shadows. Please, be each stretched leaves, five-fingered palm, a wet reflection. Float with me on this long procession of silence, cigarette smoke released from between opened leaves, the night's transfiguration, an owl, the landscape alive on its back, as if clinging to the place it began. I can go on until my mouth dries of songs, my tongue vinegar, my mouth opens to an olive O, as silent as a cemetery. Be part water, this part where the sun's rays can trace a presence heavier than water. My father, as he steps in, he enters, and me waiting all day to be unseen. My mother's palm ready to absorb my loneliness, a house led footed in loneliness. No one here can save me, 
All of us at the dining room table eating warm eggs dipped in vinegar, and no one can save me. Voices lost in airless for waterless air, you drifting farther away, and nothing left, nothing but my father's stifling voice. Thank you, and... Um, Um, this last poem is um, for somebody I've been trying to put back into the universe. I, um, next month, Baha would be exactly two years old, and two months from now would be a year since she died. And I've been trying to pull her back to me by way of the poem since the first minute that I heard of her passing. The title of this poem is Wine Glass. When your mother found strands of your hair hung up in the teeth of your comb, I squirreled them into a wine glass. It bites me hard that your life happened like an hourglass with a handful of sand. This split to the seam of my body, my body of darkness that won't kill me, but squeezes adrenaline out of my veins so I live through the pain of your absence. I am not all right to speak. My voice rims with bereavement, and I want to sing by your grave, my child, now that birds blow songs through my window. Count my sadness on the prayer beads, necklaced around my collar. If I had known the sky would inhale you out of me so quickly, I would have stayed your, your toes forever in my hands. Your face is still everywhere, even in the places I am not ogling at. Your mother's breast swells with milk for your mouth. Instead, she cups each in her hands and she delicately squeezes the milk, warm, through puffed up nipples, into a polythene bag and paces slowly into the yard, roots her knees to the earth, hands muddied as she digs the spot where she entombs the milk, there in the place you used to play with your brother. She leans back gapes into an open sky like one who had found the way of sending the milk across to you. I press a deep kiss on your grave. Did it reach your forehead? My hands cloudy over rubbing your grave. Do you feel them on your tender skin? Can I exhume your smile? Is it really exhumable without your body? The distance I feel is more than the 400 kilometers that often stands in our way. How long do I have to travel to hold you against the moon and kiss your toes? They say you are like my reflection, pulled out of the mirror I stare into. Can I pull you out, or should I just plunge my hand inside myself and just pull? Thank you. for that, Sadiq. Thank you so much. So we'll go to Ghana. Ghana is actually the focus country um, for this year's Ake Festival. But I just realized this afternoon that I haven't mentioned it once. <laughs> but there are lots of Ghanaians here. And we're lucky to have them. But for the first time coming to Ake Festival, I'm really delighted to present Ni Aikwe Parks. Hello. Lola had to call me just when I was crying. Sadiq. That was beautiful. And before I start, I have to tell you, Lagos, reluctantly, I love you. 
I'm going to do um, something old, something new, and something light as a mosquito. Um, so something old is called him. I'm going to adjust this mic because I'm reading. Is it this one? To loosen. All right. Um, okay. Let me sing you a hymn. Not the kind grandmother start humming at 6 a.m. I want to sing the strains that stem from the strains of living. My lips will be opening to rock veil tunnels that pour forth pain from crevices so dry that water only serves to hurt them. And every passage of air from lung to tongue will carry lacerations from the backs of slaves, from the veins of junkies, from the minds of the tortured. See, I want to sing you a hymn like Dana Watts sang on Sundays. Every week, I would watch her lips, looking for secrets, because somehow the air, the dust, the gloss upon her lips held a direct link to ancient suffering and future pain. Even her silence was desert wind blowing over decaying bodies. Then, she'd sing Amazing Grace, jazz it into the air we were breathing, leave it haunted, riddled with cataclysmic catastrophes, unrequited love pangs, mass lynchings, rape, internal displacement sponsored by abortion naturals, tears, sobs, and sighs would come tumbling from her open voice. Pain stripped down like old wallpaper, scraped and scrubbed to reveal pure soul. So that soared with the organ's crescendo. Amazing grace spilling like a horn's lament out of the building. Eventually, I found the secret. On her lower lip, a bruise. And my seven-year-old hands reached for my mother's when I saw the man beside her with a nasty curl in his fist. It was him. Every Sunday, she raised her voice to sing, to sing him. She crooned away all the world's cruelty so she could endure that man another Monday. And I can't sing hymns like Dana Watts because I can't sing him. So I tell her story. Uh, and I wrote this last night, it's called Inheritance. Um, yeah. I can't even say much about it because I don't really understand it yet. <laughs> Hopefully you guys will help me out. Sometimes I overhear the muted susurrations of worms bent as hooks into leaf-rich mounds of soil. The plea of voices not meant for my ears. It is gossip calculated as a rocket's purest arc. Promises slipped into the ears of lovers, hackneyed phrases like, you're as young as you feel. And my mind drifts to you, how all your life you cried like a baby, never controlled your face a network of creases that mapped you all your pain. You were my father, and I learned to love you with your face wet. This may be my twisted way of saying thanks for teaching me that even a life of nights still whispers the sun's burn. That regular appearances of one's tears do not make the body boneless. It takes strength to show how you feel, but not let your resolve waver. Knowing the hourglass of healing never loses its sand. Seeing you as a cry, as a boy, freed me, pulled me from the vortex enough times to outspin an unremarkable life. I have walked from light into the comforts of darkness, 
rebirth canals, confident that a path will unfold the way one did after I held dark soil in my teenage hands and cast it on the wood of your departure. The way this poem begins with the invisible prompting of ghosts and ends with the soft lines of a questing pen, like the earth cycling with the turning of nematodes, silent as DNA in the darkness beneath our feet. Uh, so the last poem is called Mosquito Rules. Um, and your West Africans will understand it. I actually wrote this when um, I used to go around a lot of um, London schools. And very often the kids that were um, causing ruckus were of West African origin. And their teachers were scared of them because these guys, they were, I mean, in Ghana we have a term lactogen babies. Do you, do you know what that means? Like, they're, they're big, but there's no muscle. You know, you could push them in the wind. Um, and I would often, like, they'd say, how is it you managed to work with them? Because i just tell them, I'll tell their mother, and they just shut up kind of thing. But um, I always felt like they misbehaved because they didn't understand mosquitoes. So this poem is about mosquitoes, um, but it's for the mandem, you know, the, the, the young boys on the streets of London that I used to visit in schools to work with, um, Mosquito Rules. Here goes. You think you're so hard, like a diamond geezer, like ice from a freezer, like a Greek brain teaser. You spend your time in the gym getting buff, smoke cigars to get your voice rough. You're cut tighter than a mini skirt cloth, even your mom thinks you're tough. <laughs> you think you're so hard, but you haven't met me. <laughs> you think you're so cool, Walking down the street with a perpetual high five, your body temperature's like 35, two degrees below normal. Girls throw themselves at you like bad karma. You're more laid back than a snake charmer. Snow will turn to liquid before you do. You think you're so cool. <laughs> but you haven't met me. <laughs> I sent colonials running from gold to cold. So if you think you've got the cards, fold. I'll treat you gentle like American foreign policy. I'll only attack when you disarm and attempt diplomacy. <laughs> when your guard is down, when you think you're about to get down, when you get naked, that's when I'll get you. <laughs> See, I am the West African mosquito. My powers are stronger than Vito. I'll have you screaming like your little sis while I insert my proboscis. I'll give you fever like Peggy Lee, temperature like 100 degrees as you beg for leniency. You won't be so hard when I'm done with you. You'll be on a liquid diet, so hot you can't sleep at night, and your guns can't get me, and your bling doesn't impress me. I'll burn you like a bad joke, make you thinner than a wheel spoke. And maybe as you get delirious, you realize life is serious. Your ancestors didn't struggle for you to come and mess around. Stop acting like your brain got left in the lost and found and do something with your life now. But whatever you do, don't you dare call yourself gangster till you've wrestled with malaria. Cause around this west side, Mosquito rules. <laughs> What's my name? Mosquito. The West African Mosquito. <laughs> I said, What's my name? West African Mosquito. Tell your boys I said, Bzz. more to go and they're all flying home tonight so let's let me not let me not delay at all as i invite the only other woman in this lineup and that's Teresa lola E 
evening, everyone. Okay. Um, I'm going to share three poems. Um, the first two are inspired by um, my time in boarding school in Ogun State a few years ago. Um, this first one is titled Portrait of Us as Snow White. We inherited black holes for eyes. So light was the benchmark we measured the beauty of skin against. We sat in our dorm room and discussed who the fairest of all was. The Igbo girls claimed they could be cast as foreign as long as the sun didn't betray them. The girls with skin the shade of the bronze mask our ancestors carved directed the conversation. The myth was that backstage curtains are dark colors so that dark girls can camouflage into them. We never said the word race, substituted yellow purple for white as if we knew the word white will peel our tongues down to a seed of guilt. My bow legs hung from my bunk bed like question marks. I was unsure of which shade my skin will grow into, so I could not be the lead role in this fairy tale. Now I know our ignorance is a kind of bacteria bleach multiplies instead of killing. One of my dorm mates used papaya skin lightning soap. The scent was like every other soap. She rubbed it on her skin until she was cast as Snow White in the school play. The myth is that despite all the light on her skin, her soul remains a backstage curtain. So um, in boarding school, we had a common room, and um, the only um, channel that we watched was Channel O, um, because a lot of us were banned from watching it at home. Um, and music was really a way of us bonding, and the, the coolest kids, I guess, knew the lyrics to every song, particularly every hip-hop song. So you knew like the lyrics to all 50 Cent songs, um, Lil Wayne songs, and all of that. Um, and so I wrote this poem inspired by that. This is titled, Lean Back as Instructed by Fat during one of the greatest hip hop songs of all time. <laughs> Lean Back as Instructed by Fat during one of the greatest hip hop songs of all time. You stand in front of a mirror, lean your right shoulder backwards at a 45 degree angle, and by the time you return to the mirror, your bones have stretched into hangers draped with gold chains. You wear arrogance like a rented wedding dress. You accessorize it with lyrics you memorize during lunch breaks with no one to tell you to quiet the noise. This is new to you, a joy that makes you feel like you are moonwalking on God's eyelashes. Hip hop is the unofficial national anthem at school. So when the students gather, you recite the lyrics to lean back, lean your shoulder at a 45 degree angle and watch them gaze at the perfect arc your tongue burning with no lyrics left unscraped. Till now you carry the name unidentified female body in the yearbook pictures. You tried scratching out the name, shifted to the busy table at the cafeteria, but forget subtlety. Sometimes you need a kind of confidence you can dangle on your neck like a shark on a hook, an act of pretense to tell others you wear shinier ghosts, shimmy your name in their face, and what better struct instructor to mimic if not hip hop? You watch as your name gets pinned to a notice board of tongues. Their tongues touch your name like hands reaching for the garment of Jesus. You pose for the new yearbook picture, chains dangling on your weak neck. This was never you. But who wouldn't stretch their body into a flag to avoid being deported back into their shadow? The last poem is an ode to my grandmother, who I found out her dream was always to become a singer, but that didn't work out. So um, this is Sing Ma Sing. My grandmother now spends her time singing in her room, and a gospel of notes leap out of her mouth. The hairs on the wall stand in ovation. The mirror applauds and she smiles back, but the windows are always closed, letting in no other audience. Decades have passed clocks between its fingers and my grandmother's voice still sits in an unventilated room. Each morning she leaves the room but without her voice. She only borrows it for church. To sing to God she's still here and with strength only old age can conjure up. One evening she confides in me that her singing voice is suffocating. 
the result of hiding in her room for years, forgetting that every living thing inside us also has to breathe to survive. I do not know how to console her. My ears are the only thing I have to give a wise woman. She sighs and says to me, Teresa, do not waste your talent, my dear. Gasping for air, my grandmother's voice now crawls out of her mouth during conversations, speaks wistfully about her youthful days when she dreamt of becoming a singer. In her dream, the spotlight seeps through her skin and her body is a flashlight glowing even in the darkest valleys. She sings, and each that listens are saved from something that is killing them. This is to say it was not about fame, just her yearn to be light. A yearn evident in every form her voice finds itself. When my grandmother speaks, every worry in me loosens from the chemical bonds that made it acid enough to burn. I mourn the voice never heard, but I imagine an alternate version of this story. In the alternate version, it's the early 1960s. My grandmother's hair is rich black, her knees are still vibrant. One afternoon, my grandmother sees the sun, notices the way it mimics a spotlight and opens the window to feel its glow on her skin. My grandmother has Motown record label aching to touch her garment, a crowd requesting an autograph. All want to hear her sing their mouth spreading the good news. But back then it was day. Now it is night. I am the age she once was and I am dodging deja vu with practice. At least I now know that breathing is not just for the body, but for the things inside us that will live beyond us to carry our names. My grandmother never became a singer, but I refuse to call it a regret because I carry her name, a generation carries her name, and tell me, what greater way is there for your lights to be a mark on others? Thank you. There's something I forgot to do, which we must now quickly do. We need to give away some prizes, and then I'm going to call the, the last poet. Remember that Nikon, Nikon competition? Yes, so we want to award the first prize, but also to some of the participants. All the participants, tell me what their handles are, just one by one. Okwe, you start looking for the second one. Grace, give me your first name and... Auntie? Just give me one person, and then we do the winner last. Yeah. Okay, Muiwa. Your handle is Mui's... Vincent Anani, where are you? Vincent Anani? Yep, come and get your prize. So the good news is that you won something. The bad news is you didn't win the camera. It's okay. No, it's okay. It's better to be blunt. Let everybody know and be happy. Next. Muyi Wright. The handle is Mui Right. This is the complex thing. Oh, congrats. You see, we appreciate your entry, but you didn't win. <laughs> Next. Angry Black Queer. All your contributions at the festival are much appreciated, but you didn't win. Aziza. Aziza. I'm very happy you came. And uh, well done for taking those beautiful pictures. Wait, don't forget your lanyard. Could be very useful. Black Boy Review. That's, uh, what's his name? Uh, Chime. Chime, where are you, my darling? Gorgeous boy. I like you so much. You didn't win. (laughs) 
healer overall. That's the handle. Healer overall. Oh, she's coming. Hey. Very nice. Hmm? We have not given this one. Now. Thank you so much. You did very well. Nice effort. But, but what? That's it. Frank Ugo. Ugo? Frank? He's left? Okay, we'll give it to him. It doesn't matter really because he didn't win. <laughs> Next. <laughs> That's all. So, and the winner is... Waziri Umaru Saliu Mahe. First, let's give you the general prize. That's everyone. Very, I like this guy. Are you a poet? You are? I, I just knew it. Okay. So, there you are. Are you going to wear this shirt too? Wear it, wear it today. Let me hold your card for you. Wear it. Open it. This one, you've given him large. Don't we have medium? Or small. Yeah. <laughs> There's no need for you to turn your Nikon t-shirt into a bada. <laughs> Give you. Say, eh? Everything is large. Well. Just wait. Wow. Mm -mm -mm -mm. <laughs> This is what I have to do every morning. It's one of the reasons I moved out. Wow, look at that. Wear your hat. Did they give us any Nikon shoe? No? Okay. Oh yeah, wear your line here too. Wow. No worry, you can hang your key there later. <laughs> All right, so it gives me great pleasure. I don't even think our folks from Nikon are here. But on behalf of Nikon, here's your camera. You did well. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so now, we bring the final poet all the way from Itaka. Everybody know Ted you call called me and said, if you don't get this guy, I don't know. I came may not be the same. I didn't want to take any chances. So I quickly invited him. Join me in welcoming Aishan Hutchinson. Uh, good evening. Lola, you could have said I'm from Jamaica. The, the, the exotic leaning. <laughs> the street lights shed pearls that night. Stray dogs ran but did not bark at the strange shadows. The minister of all could not sleep. Mosquitoes swarmed around his net. <laughs> it, it's a condition. Should I start again? 
The street lights shed pearls that night. Stray dogs ran but did not bark at the strange shadows. The minister of all could not sleep. Mosquitoes swarmed around his net, his portrait and his pitcher and drinking glass. The flags stiffened on the embassy building but did not fall when the machine guns flared and reminded that stars were inside the decrypt towns in shanty zinc holes staring at the fixed constellation. Another asthmatic whirl of pistons passed. The chandelier fell, the carpet sparkled, flames burst into the lantana bushes, the stone horse winnied by the bank's marble entrance, three large cranes with searchlights lit the poncianas, a quiet flamboyance struck with the fever of children's laughter. Then all at once, the cabbage palm and the bullhoof trees shut their fans. The harbor grew empty and heavy. The sea was sick and exhausted. The royal palms did not salute when the jeeps roamed up the driveway and circled the fountain. The lignum, the lignum vitae did not bow and shed purple bugles, but did not surrender. The homeless did not run, but the dead flew in a silver stream that night. Their silk hair thundered, and their heels crushed the busy nuts and ceramic roofs. The night had the scent of cut grass sprayed with poison. The night smelled of bullets. The moon did not hide. The prayers, the prisoners prayed in their bunkers. The baby drank milk while its mother slept, and by the window, its father could not part the curtains. The rumor broke first in Duck and Field. Fitzy dropped the shutters of his rum shop. By the time it got to Dalvey, there were three suicides. The mechanic in Cheswick heard and gave his woman a fine trashing. But to her credit, she nearly scratched his heart out his chest during the howl and leather smiting. The betting shops and the whorehouse daylights at Golden Grove were empty. It was brutal to see the women with their hands at their jaws on the terrace. Seeing them, you know the rumor was not rumor. The rumor was gospel. The cane cutters did not get their salary. Better to crucify Christ again, slaughter newborns, strike down the cattle. But to make a man not have money in his pocket on a payday Friday, was abomination itself. Worse, cane cutters who filed their spines against the sun, bringing down great walls of cane. You would shudder to see them, bare-backed men bent kissing the earth so to slash away the roots of the canes. Every year, the same men, different cane. And when different men, the same cane, the cane they cannot kill, living for this one day of respite when they would straighten themselves to pillars and drop dollars on counters and act like daylights is as sweet at the Ritz and the devastating beauty queens with their galling fragile attention gave them forever to live in a tickle, the wetted cane piece this one day forgotten in a whore's laugh. Suddenly, these men fill Hampton Court Square, demanding the foreman's head. They were thirsty for blood and for rum. Fitzy stayed hidden in his shop behind the shutters. He heard one man say, it was not the foreman's head they should get. That would not be wise. The man continued, it must be fire for fire, the factory must be burnt down. But the men murmured, they were afraid. Someone made a joke, they roared, and soon they were saying 
Fire can't buy rum. They were roaring money, then rum. Pounding Fitz's shutter, shouting his name for him to set them on fire. They grew hoarse against the shutters. The sun had taken all motion out of their voices. Fitzy could hear them through the zinc, like dogs about to die, cried out children, that dry rustle you hear after the crop is torched and the wind bristles the ashes. No men were out there, only a sharing noise. That was when Fitzy opened the shutters. Their red eyes in charcoal suits looked up at him and with an overseer's scorn, he nodded them in. <clears throat> After the hurricane walks a silence, deranged, white as the white helmets of government surveyors looking into roofless shacks, Assessing stunned fowls, noting inquiries into the logic of feathers reversed like gullies still retching. They scribble facts about fallen cedars spread out like dead generals and leaf medallions. They draw tables to show the shore has rearranged its idea of beauty for the resort villas miraculously not rattled by the hurricanes, call it Cyclops, passage through the lives of children and pigs, the one eye that unhooked banjos from the hills, smashed them in Rio Valley. They record how it howled off to that dark parish St. Thomas, stumping drunk with wire lashes and cramps, paralyzing electric poles and coconut trees, dishing discard among neighbors, exposed, standing among their flattened, scattered lives for the first time. It passed through Aunt May's head, upsetting the furniture, left her chattering something a cross between a fowl and a child. They can't say how it tore down her senses, no words, packing their instruments, flies, returning to genuflect at their knees on Aunt May's face, gone soft. No words except don't fret, driving off as if they had left better promises to come. Thank you, Lola. Um, <clears throat> I'll end with a poem in the voice of the great reggae dub pioneer, Lee Scratch Perry. No applause for Lee Scratch Perry. It's, 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 I'm increasingly becoming suspicious of Nigeria. <laughs> to the point that I can't find the poem. Um, who is Lee Scratch Perry, one asks. If you know Bob Marley, then you know Lee Scratch Perry. Then you should be ashamed of yourself for not knowing Lee Scratch Perry. <laughs> Who's the great architect of Bob Marley's sound? The man who had a studio called the Black Ark where some of the greatest reggae music was produced. Fella had the shrine, Lee Scratch Perry had the ark. A little bit of a... Um, <clears throat> the reason why the studio was called the Black Ark because it was a place to house not just sounds, but all of the experiences of the Jamaican story, right? So the ark was filled with different rooms and in each room, Lee Scratch Perry would have different things going on. 
but primarily it was a recording studio. But one day, Lee Scratch Perry decided to burn that studio down because he's bad like that. <laughs> so in this poem, in his voice, I wanted to reimagine the building of the studio, the ark by scratch. The genie says, build a studio. I build a studio from ash. I make it out of peril and slum things. I alone when blood and bullet and all cries fucking American dollar politicians start the pressure down to nothing. When the equator is confused and coke bubbles on tin foil to cemented wreath, I built it. A conga drum so hollowed through the future pyramids up long before CDs spin away roots man knocking down by the seaside like captives wheeling by the Keba River. The genie says, build a studio, but don't take any foul in it, just electric. So I make it. My echo chamber with shock rooms of rainbow, King Arthur's sword keep in, and one for the Maccabees alone, for covenant is born between man and worm. Next room is Stone Age, after that iron, and one I name Freeze, for too much ice downtown in the brains of all them crossing Duke Street, holy like Parsons, and in the circuit breaker, the red switches for death, and the black switches for death, and the master switch is black and red. So if US, Russia, China, Israel talk, missiles talk, I talk that switch I call Melchizedek. I build a closet for the waterfalls, one for the rivers, another for oceans, next for secrets. The genie says, build a studio. I built it without gopher wood. Now, consider the nest of bees in the cranium of the gong. Consider the nest of wasp in the heart of the bush doctor. Consider the nest of locusts in the gut of the black heart man. I put them there, and the others that vibrate at the feast of the Passover, when the collie weed is passed over the roast fish and cornbread. I upset her, I jangle on the black wax, the super ape, E.T., I cleared the wave. Again, consider the burning bush in the ears of Kalanji, and the burning sword in the mouth of the fireman, and the burning pillars in the eyes of the gargamel. I put them there to outlast Earth as I navigate on one of Saturn's rings. I mitre solid shadows setting fire to snow in my ark. I credit not the genie, but the coral rock. I'm an am stone. I am perfect. Myself is a vanishing conch shell speeding round a discotheque. At the embassy of angels, skeletons ramble to check out my creation dub, and sex is dub, stripped to the bone, and dub is the heart breaking the torso, to spring olive beaked, to be eaten up by sunlight. Thank you. So I told you a little lie. Actually, we have got one more poet, but I totally forgot. Please welcome Logan February. He's coming to do just two poems. Fantastic young man. Yes, because I'm short. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'll be reading just two poems. Uh, this is an older one. It's called The Bodies of Dead Boys. My boyfriend is a mortician, the kind that sits next to crows, enjoying the odor of departure, the coming and the going. I am unfamiliar, but he claims to know me. I sell my body to him for information. Tell me what you know of me. Am I truly a river 
Or is that a hallucination too? Is it normal to talk to shovels and ask them to be gentle? I'm sorry, how did we meet again? Something about bicycles, wasn't it? About going round, about brakes. He claims I am not an ending. I try to prove myself. A group of crows is a murder. A group of shovels is a pile. A pile of bodies is the pilgrimage where Scorpio hands teach me to open my bones and reveal insects and marrow. I strip myself. He thinks it is about sex and preservation. I call myself a half-dead thing. This romance, my embalmment. He claims to be able to make me trickle. I tell him I love him in a wounded way. Um, this second one is a bit of a response to the last one I read, and it is a poem written after Safia El Hilo, who is an amazing Su Sudanese poet, and it is called The Dead Boy is Poured Back into His Body. The dead boy is poured back into his body in this magnificent heat, and for this reason his legs are a gospel. A ringlet of black hair wound around the air's crooked finger. I'm talking about power, current, events foster flashback, defibrillate. Embellish the gasp so it becomes a seam in the lung, a place to say it started, the learning of warmth a second time. A bird perched on the scarecrow's shoulder without hungry intent. So you realize you are alive. Now what? You leave the sugar out and complain of ants. Tremble, I command. Then I ask, why do you tremble? Object in mirror may be uglier than it appears. Perhaps sadder, perhaps object in mirror is not in mirror at all. Share your loss, O oh quiet creature of thirst. I imagine a spark's reflection should also electrify something. You are left with ants a pilgrimage of them, on the pillowcase, in your wine glasses, on your way to class, in Twitter DMs, in your sleep. Sure, you can cauterize a void, but you have a gap even in your teeth. You cry into his pillow so he dreams of you at night. Sunny rain, lion cub, delicate inertia, the mortician wakes up already drunk on bad wine. All that is asked, what are you carrying? Put it down. Thank you. Nineteen years old. Mark my words. That boy is going to be huge. Very rare that one comes across such incredible talents. When I read his manuscript, I was literally weak at the knees just from wonder. Thank you so much. So we've come to the end, but there's one thing that I need you to do for me. The guests need to leave because they're going to pick up their luggage and then go to the airport. If you're an Ake Festival guest traveling tonight to your country, Please get up now and just go. The buses are waiting for you. We love you. Lagos loves you. Thank you. I don't want you to miss your flights. So let's just wait for them to get into the get in the lift and oh Mona now wants to kiss everybody. Let's just let them leave. Okay, I'm now going to count down from 10. Please go. Those of you taking selfie there. 10, 9, or else you stay in Nigeria, we'll kidnap you. We'll let you go back again. <laughs> they're not moving, they're there now. Allah. Could you just move them along? I don't want them to miss their flights. They're flying at...